looking for is learning about what everyone else is doing. So um, we've got a couple of handy volunteers, Jay Sampson and Chris Nicholson from um, MOJ, I'm going to say, and Homes England. Is that right? I think it's right. Yes. Yeah, that's correct. That's yeah. Right. Is it specifically Office of the Public Guardian, Jay? Yeah, we do an overview. Um, yeah. Excellent. And um, so you're going to be talking about your services. So Jay's going to go first. Chris is going to go second. Um, and I'm just looking to see if we've got Andy DeVale on the call. Um, because Andy said from Work Visible, a company called Work Visible, who do some training for us. <coughs> Uh, it's going to do a visual record of it. I don't know. Are you there, Andy? Yeah. Maybe not. Maybe he's struggling with the internet. Oh! Okay. That's funny, isn't it? Say his name, and up he pops, Mr. DeVale. Good afternoon, folks. Hello. Right, well, with, with no further ado, I'm going to hand over to, or just, uh, you missed that, Andy, I just said you're going to be visually recording. We'll have a look at that, I don't know, at the same time, we'll, we'll see, see what Jay's got planned. But I'll hand straight over to Jay, and we'll watch you in the background. Happy days. Cool. Okay, um, first... Major question, can anyone see the screen that I've shared? It's Microsoft Teams, so it's always hit and miss, but can you see this yep. lot? Cool. Okay, um, so kicking off uh, a little bit about me, who am I? Uh, I'm Jay Sampson. I actually stole a lot of these ideas from the top trumps, uh, fashion that's going through the MOJ DNT DM Slack channel, so on here, some of sprints. Um, but yeah, been working in delivery for for about four years, um, started in Parliament, which is not an agile space yet um, in their portfolio area, um, and then moved to kind of project support and then into delivery management, working with the great development teams there. Um, I've been at MOJ DNT for a couple of years um, and now work as lead delivery manager at the Office of the Public Guardian, um, also at the moment interim head of delivery. So today I can talk to you a little bit about some of the challenges, some of the wins, um, some of the learnings um, I've experienced over the last 18 months and four years actually. Um, and yeah, go from there. There'll be time for questions at the end. So MOJ, DNT, how we roll. Um, I am not an interaction designer, so this is not the scale. But just a really quick overview of MOJ, DNT. Um, it covers wide spans of the justice system um, from CICA, which is the Criminal Injuries Compensation Authority, the Office of Public Guardian, Legal Aid Agency, Her Majesty's Prison and Probation Service, Platforms and Architecture, you can see running across the middle there, Central Digital, um, Technology Services, Security Group, Delivery Unit, and our newest kind of venture into data analytics, which is a separate directorate. Um, so in our profession, we have a mixture of uh, levels of delivery management, from fast dreamers, which is kind of the associate six month rotation that runs across government um, right through to the kind of head of profession. At the moment, um, we're running at about 90%, or sorry, 90 civil servants with 20 contractors and some in flight vacancies. That doesn't include uh, our managed services, which are brought in specially, you know, for deliverables and outcomes. Um, and just wanted to touch on a little bit about how we work. So a lot of the work that comes through is in a pipeline that is connected to cabinet office where we have to present quarterly roadmaps. So that is a main driver for our work. Um, each of those blobs on that slide has a very unique and I guess complex own ecosystem. So for example, platforms and architecture would be underlying infrastructure. Uh, prisons and probation have their initiatives and priorities driven from that perspective. Um, and OPG, again, have a different way of formulating. But the one commonality is that we will have to get spend approval from Cabinet Office. Um, 
like I said, these aren't to scale and they're quite a kind of amorphous look, but that just gives you some size and shape of the MIJ at DNT. We've got a range of public facing and internal facing systems from a case management system that buys and works with um, OPG right through to in-cell technology, working with prisons um, and everything in between. So today, uh, a bit of a deep dive onto the, on the delivery profession, what's going on. This is a taster, a sprinkling. Um, so at the, as I said before, we've got those different SMT areas. Each of those has its own community of practice um, and they run kind of in various different ways, depending on how that team likes to operate. It could be weekly, could be fortnightly, could be monthly. Um, aside from that, we've also got work groups and squads, which originated in HMPPS, which I would call the Uber cop of over 30 fantastic delivery professionals. Um, and some of the work that's going on in that space is really helping to drive initiatives. And this is all outside of immediate delivery teams. So things like um, rhythms and rituals group, looking at best practice, um, sharing our knowledge, looking at how we manage knowledge across our teams and areas. Um, Agile and digital self-managed learning course, which is a, yeah, a six month long course, looking at introducing agile ways of working and digital ways to non-digital professionals. So whether that's someone from policy or a present background, um, and that's run by in-house teams as well. Um, so as I mentioned, we've got seven communities of practice and we meet quarterly where we have a one of those communities of practice do a takeover ultimately, and they have artistic and creative license to run that however they choose. Um, gonna sort of jump around a little bit and go on to recruitment um, because yeah, it's something that touches pretty much every department and it can be a painful experience or a fun experience, but just wanted to share some of the learnings that we had from last year um, in recruiting into the DM profession. Um, so we ran some joint campaigns back in November and we coordinated some DM and SDM campaigns. What was different about these were they were across multiple directorates and areas. So instead of just hiring one DM into say OPG or another area, it was cross-cutting. Um, these are the results. We smashed the SLA or the, the lead times um, and that was through the hard work of the panels that made those up. Um, we also did a bit of extra social media. So we had that campaign run alongside and that really helped to drive engagement, but also explain to candidates kind of how we work in MOJ and what it's like to be an associate or a mid or a senior across the board. Um, so yeah, just wanted to share some of those and happy to talk about how we coordinated that as well. Fine, that's something that people are working and dealing with. So we'll dive down a layer um, and go into depth into the OPG, which is the Office of the Public Guardian. Um, now, this arm's length body is set up to help enable lasting powers of attorney, which is, if you're not familiar with it, if someone loses capacity to make decisions, this enables you to make decisions on another person's behalf. So kind of setting that up. At the moment, it's a 20 page paper Form, which needs to be stamped and sent back, and that is the deed. Um, and yeah, it's not a digital solution, as you can imagine, but still very, very important. Um, so, so kind of diving into our estate, that image is slightly out of date on the right, but it gives a really good overview. We've got two service areas, about eight digital delivery teams in that space. Um, the top left is Casrec, that's our last legacy system that we're in the process migrating off of. Um, on the right hand side, you can see the last power of attorney where it's got fully digital. That's a work group that is looking to ultimately change the law so that we don't have to have the deed or they're not 100% sure on how it's going to look, but change the legislation to enable us to make that a much cleaner end to end digital journey um, to reach more people. Over the last 18 months, yes, some of the areas um, successes. So our use team moved from alpha to public to live, uh, great success. And that's all through our internal service assessments, um, which I'm sure many people have experienced is a really great way to learn and build the best possible services for our users. Um, in terms of the teams itself, we're spread across at the moment, kind of Nottingham and Birmingham, so very much middle England. 
and we were working in a, I guess, a hybrid way before the pandemic, which really gave us a head start in terms of our tooling, but also working out how the teams would like best buy to work. So um, we've got a monthly alignment meeting in place, which is where we kind of join up all of the dots. So not too tightly coupled, but that started out about two years ago as a four hour planning meeting, which is as painful as it sounds um, with lots of conversation decisions. We've since stripped that right back down to a one hour alignment meeting with a, a rapid check in, um, all the things you would expect from a team. So help doing a temperature check at the start, um, looking at dependencies, top priorities, but then also giving airtime for different professions. So whether that's our technical architects talking through the roadmap and the themes coming up for the next kind of quarter or financial year to our UCD professionals who yeah, just yesterday gave us a great overview of some of the work happening across the teams um, to really get that cross working happening. Um, where to next? Okay, Jedi. Um, yeah, building and growing in house capability. So uh, what I caught Barry earlier this week, he talked about you know, some of the lessons that we've learned and some of the journeys that we've been on. So one that I wanted to share from OPG Digital is that we've actually moved from an 80% contractor workforce to a 90% civil servant workforce. Um, this is over the time, like time period of about 18 months. And it was really difficult, I'm not going to lie. Some of the main drivers for this were the introduction of IR35, which I'm sure many on this call are familiar with, but ultimately the change in way in which tax is calculated for contractors. Um, we lost 12 developers in the space of two weeks, which had a massive impact, as you can imagine, to our delivery. Um, but it also gave us an opportunity to design our team makeup, introduce a people plan, but then also look at how we phase that. So rather than bringing everyone in at once, which would completely disrupt all of the teams, we, would actually, we actually did that in a phased or waived approach. And I worked with the senior leadership team, principal um, developer as well in this space to actually phase that out and see what it would look like so that we didn't just have six new developers joining a team on day one, which would, yeah, as we know, always change the impact and the dynamic of that team. Um, this has helped us build internal successes. So though we did have to rebuild our team effectively from, from scratch, what it enabled us to do is actually get the right levels of developer. So previously, all of our contractors had been working at senior level and have a, bunk, a front or back end, <clears throat> excuse me, specialism. What we moved to is actually having um, juniors, mid and senior, but then a generic kind of developer or software engineer role so that they could specialize and build their skills in the front and back end. Um, this has been really successful. We've had internal promotions on multiple external occasions um, and campaigns, and it's also helped build um, capability. But our testing community of practice, for example, has grown and we've also moved to continuous integration deployment across our teams. So moving from one release every two weeks to what is now looking at about over 200 releases a month, which has really helped close down the feedback loop with OPG Digital, but also you know, empower the teams to kind of make those changes and actually be a bit riskier in the technical space. Um, um, so yeah, last up as well is the communities of practice. Um, so the DM community of practice meets regularly, uh, fortnightly. And we deep dive into areas such as hybrid working, for example, scaling or not scaling, um, and also baselining culture, uh, which is some of the highlights over the last few weeks. Um, some other learnings as well. All for one, not one size fits all. So this has been prompted as well recently. Uh, I've been working with our lead product manager, uh, Kaz Hufton. Consultancy has ultimately been brought in to bottle up the OPG magic and disseminate across the wider MOJ digital and technology landscape. Um, we've had to be very, very clear and to the point that this is not just a process map that you can then apply. There's people involved, there's culture, there's change, and it is not an overnight fix. So even with the best visualization and distillation, 
it's not a repeatable process. You can take pieces, but you can't just say, follow this process and you'll get X result. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't be working in such a complex world and requiring these agile methodologies and approaches to enable the teams. So it's taken a lot of conversation, but I think these kind of two phrases really sum it up. Um, the first one, having a single vision for the team um, and direction is really, really helpful. Not one size fits all, as I'm sure everyone's encountered, is those kind of trying to fit into projects, or I guess governance structures or financial cycles. Can't replicate lift and shift and just make that work. You have to spend the time to build those relationships, find out what works and experiment and test you know, fail and fast, all of the things that we do on a daily basis with our teams. So as the yeah, small child here is trying to do a square peg in a round hole, it doesn't, it's not going to work like that. And we can't template it up and pretend that it's going to be that easy. Um, so we're working with them to really help communicate like how we've gone about it, but more from a story perspective and give across a recipe of some of the things that we've used that people can take and use for their own. Um, but also, you know, things that they can disagree with and challenge and come up with their own designs and ways to, to work across the area. Um, just looking at the time. So, okay, last up, um, hashtag winning. So this is the experiment, the last part, um, the takeaway bit, that is something that I've done with pretty much all the teams I've worked in across OPG um, and MOJ. So what's it all about? So this is something that you can take away and experiment in your areas. It's a form of kudos, but here's how like, the format works. So initially it started as a winning Wednesday because it rhymes, it's got iteration, and it's yeah, it's super helpful to have that consistency. Why? Um, you'll find out when we do it in a minute, but to celebrate and shout out great collaboration or support, being mindful that not every Wednesday, people will have things to celebrate. Um, and actually, it's okay just to say, you know, no update this today, or I don't want to take part. Um, it's whatever's comfortable for the team or the audience. How? Um, best executed at the end of a stand up, you know, in that time that you'd normally be in the meeting room dispersing or, um, yeah, wrapping up. It creates a different environment and vibe. Um, and also on the Slack channel. So if it can't be done via video call, having those face-to-face, -face, sorry, having that Slack channel to work asynchronously using emojis and GIFs. Um, so we're actually gonna run this now. Um, I know people weren't prepared for that, but in the chat, here's how it works. Write down one shout out to either someone that you've worked closely with who has really helped this week or made you smile, or even just a win. So whether that's, you know, watched a great movie, the team estimated without you needing to be there or, you know, Jira actually loaded on time without offering, um, whatever it could be. So please feel free uh, to use the chat. I'm going to time box it to three minutes because if not, it will just keep on rolling. Um, and if there's no takers, there will be takers. So we've got some shout outs coming through already. What we found is it's really difficult to do the first time, um, and particularly with a team on video call. But consistency and keeping going is the key, um, and the team either make a joke or get used to it. What's that coming through? Okay, two more minutes. Uh, my win this week is yeah being invited on here and getting an opportunity to share share the story um, and yeah talk to you all and ask your questions. So what we got so good January team research sessions. Shout out to Lewis. Lewis did a great job chairing the first delivery community meeting. Whole team involvement in user research session. Some team planning. Shout out to David Durant, Aaron. Plus face to face backlog refinement, defect out to research. Some more shout outs. Again, this is just a formula. Um, take it to your teams, see how they would like to roll it. 
Um, you'll see what works. And if people ask why, explain to them, they'll know by the end of it and that feeling that they get. Um, that's it for me. I don't want to take up too much time and over to any questions. Generic. Just wondering if there's any real recipe for success that you could call out in terms of going in house with all your, you know, that's an impressive figure, isn't it? 90% now in house. I'm just wondering how you felt, what was the real enabler that made that happen? I know it took a couple of years or 18 months or whatever, but that's really impressive. Sorry. You've re-muted yourself, Jay. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, great question. Um, there's a lot of factors, as you can imagine. One of the biggest areas we found was building confidence through delivery. Um, so whilst this transition or whilst this change was happening, we, we did maintain stable delivery throughout. Um, that really helped demonstrate to the business side, I guess, of things that actually we we are confident in what we're doing and they trusted us for that approach. But also things like when the pandemic hit, we were able to pivot very quickly, but because we had that in-house team as well, we were able to move to the most valuable things. So yeah, getting trust um, and building delivery confidence. I think also having a plan, like it sounds really simple, but at the moment, most recruitment is either reactive um, or, you know, someone leaves the backfill. But actually being able to plan and phase that approach really minimised the impact of the team um, and communicating it as well. So if we weren't successful on, say, phase one and we needed an extra designer or user researcher, it's being open and upfront about that. Sounds good. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Okay, so a question in the chat. So the work the teams do, how much is Greenfield versus keeping existing stuff going? Um, so at the moment, we are probably about 90% keeping stuff going. Um, given, yeah, we're about to migrate off our last of three legacy management systems. Got some discoveries coming up in the pipeline. Um, but yeah, the majority of it is working with existing tech um some of it is yeah, 30 plus years old which is again one of the reasons that we're migrating off of it um but also in the space particularly around modernizing lpa the team that is working on that is not just your standard delivery team it's got embedded policy team members in there um, and also members with the business so again a new and exciting space in that Happy to yeah, answer any questions if they come to you on Slack afterwards, if that's useful. Um, and yeah, thanks for having me. Cool. Thank you very much. Should we? Excellent. Should we have a little look at what Andy's done? Do you want to follow through, Andy? Hello, folks. So I've just got a few scribbles here. I, what I'll do is I will I will colour it in and uh, share afterwards. So here we've got the man himself. Uh, what can I say? We've got the Jedi in here. But, I mean, I thought this whole story about the switch from kind of contractors to in-house, that's just what a phenomenal change. Um, huge amount coming out there. We've got some stuff around the OPG, the different bits. Um, I love the awful one. This was supposed to be the Three Musketeers. I don't know how, you know, there's two and there's, the third one's in behind there somewhere. And then we've got the, the, um, the winning recipe. Um, out here, which which thought was lots of fun. But still, this whole idea of alignment came across really strongly, both in terms of the one for all and all for, all for one, uh, but no, not one size fits all, but also in how you were kind of organising those uh, monthly catch-ups and alignment sessions and so on. And then around the questions, I love this uh, building confidence through delivery, uh, which, I, which I tried to capture there. So, um, yeah, that was it. You will get an updated version in the post. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you.
and you'll be i bet you've got a couple of sessions coming up that were in the email you'll be teaching people to do a bit of this themselves yeah this is this is kind of doing this live is quite challenging but there's loads and loads of ways that you can use uh, visual thinking practically um that are much more accessible so we'll be, we'll be giving away some of those uh tips around those kind of things as well and i think i'm going to regularly hop along here and um capture this stuff as well if if i'm welcome to do that thank you very much right chris are you ready i am yes right okay let me share my screen can you see that okay excellent good well i will make a start looking forward to seeing what uh my picture looks like that you draw <laughs> <laughs> um okay so um my name's chris nicholson i'm a senior delivery manager in the digital team for homes england working in newcastle so i've been here for over seven years now um and prior to working at Homes England, I was working in the legal sector in a similar space around software development and IT management. So today I would like to present how we have used service teams, uh, what they're all about and the challenges that they have um, presented to us. Uh, feel free to ask questions. Uh, maybe at the end would be a bit easier. Um, so some of you might have heard of Homes England. We are the government's housing accelerator. Um, our priorities are around investing in building new homes, helping families and individuals to own or rent their own home through programmes that you would have heard of like Help to Buy. Uh, we sell land that will be suitable for building more homes in the future. We um, have been bringing um, over 450 hectares of derelict land back into use for local people um, and making sure our organisation continues to develop so we're ready to respond to things government asks us to do in the future. Um, so this is what uh, I'm going to go through. Um, so. What are service teams? What do they do? Who we are, what we've done, and our challenges. Right, so. Right, so in its simplest, uh, a big project that we might have in Homes England is delivered by a, a multidisciplinary project team. But when that project moves into business as usual, it is handed over to a service team to manage the support and changes going forward. Now, previously, we're going back to about March last year, that would have been managed by a team called Product Support. But since their portfolio became so large, so their responsibility was looking after about 30 plus legacy products it became a significant challenge to manage each of these products and their stakeholders to a satisfactory level and this is when we had the advent of service teams to support a smaller number of products within each service team and to enable the teams to have a closer relationship with the business stakeholders right so um so this is what we're all about um to deliver value frequently so going back to the old model of product support some business stakeholders had to wait a long time to see changes and value delivered for their products just because of the sheer size of the product backlog and that's now changed through service teams because we have smaller backlogs and less stakeholders to manage it's been possible to break down silos there is a good working pace, and that's achieved by delivering a sizable chunk of work per sprint for each of the products, rather than the delivery being delayed by a conflict of priorities. Uh, the structure is simple. Um, it's a dedicated team of developers, testers, and product owners. 
reporting to a smaller number of stakeholders. The stakeholders now feel like they're being heard and the teams have regular meetings to build these relationships. The team is self-organizing because of the size of the team, it's easier for them to be more self-managing. This gives the service team autonomy and a stronger morale. With a product support team in the past, it required closer management because of the volume of the work and the conflict of the priorities. There is also regular reflection through monthly team health checks and retros per sprint. And uh, just today we had our January health check and we had mostly greens, uh, so that was really good. Um, so looking at the stakeholder benefits. Um, so the service team brings many benefits to the business stakeholder who is ultimately responsible for the products that are supported. As mentioned, the delivery of their needs is more prioritized and they receive quicker responses through dedicated Teams feeds and regular catch-ups and regular show and tells. By not needing to support that very long list of products, it gives the service team additional capacity to think outside the box, such as looking at the modernization of legacy products, to which there's many. Um, and whilst the big new shiny projects are taken on by dedicated project teams, which are called the Evolve program, it is possible for the service team to work on smaller projects associated with the products that they support because of the stronger knowledge that the team has in those products that they manage. There's also a dedicated product manager per team who takes on the role of understanding the user needs, building relationships, defining the vision and prioritizing. This moves such responsibilities away from the delivery manager and allows them to focus on the day-to-day -day delivery of the work. So I'll let you see what the current service teams look like. Um, so the first is my own, which um, we look after products for the investment space. You'll notice that we just love our acronyms. <laughs> uh, so that's a typical setup for a team where we have a delivery manager, a product manager, business analysts, a number of developers and testers. Um, we've got another in um, the help to buy and affordable housing space. Um, and it should be noted that what our teams lack at the moment is technical architects and user researchers, which would usually be provisioned if a smaller project was to hit the team, but due to funding, we don't have that luxury at the moment. Um, and they're the systems that they support. <coughs> um, and then we've got a third service team that looks after products for land. Um, and they also look after some of the products um, for the regulations agency, RSH. Uh, right, okay, so what have we done so far, so since about April last year? Um, so we've deconstructed the product support team, as I mentioned, we've adapted to new ways of working and aligned with agile best practice. We've created dedicated PBIs, backlogs and boards and Azure DevOps for each service team. We've changed the rhythms and meetings. We've rebranded the prioritization forum meeting to just a stakeholder forum because we're able now to manage priorities within our own stakeholder meetings for the products we look after. We've continued to deliver at pace and we've been able to keep the wheels turning consistently and we've completed knowledge transfer to remove single points of failure and to support future onboarding. Um, so adapting to new ways of working and aligning with agile best practice, the product support team um, didn't follow um, all the, the best practice approaches entirely. 
just because of how much they had to manage. Um, so that's something we've been able to focus on as a service team. This is easier to manage and take forward when the backlog isn't so vast. The stand-ups now last just 15 minutes and is relevant to all of the team. Uh, whereas stand-ups within the support team in the past would have usually taken a good length of time because of all the products they had to look after. There's a clearer vision for the team and um, goals are set through the product owner and the business. Um, and because the workload's very manageable, it's been possible to include a training afternoon every sprint for the team to focus on new tech and develop the ways of working. Uh, sorry if I repeat myself a little bit here. Um, but uh, it's much easier to have a single backlog for the team rather than this being spread across multiple boards. It makes it easier for managing velocity and understanding the current capacity and resourcing. Planning is made easier. Um, there's now time to make enhancements rather than constantly firefighting all the different products because the team works on the same products full time. It enables members of the team to be product experts. And because of that, it helps them to start to think outside of the box to identify additional enhancements, which we can make to the portfolio that the service team supports. Now, uh, for legacy products, we can now consider the modernization of the product. The team is empowered to make those changes which they feel are necessary rather than having to go through a lot of bureaucracy to get the sign off for the work to be done. Um, building new business relationships. I think the biggest benefit of the service teams is the relationships that we've been able to develop with the business stakeholders. They now feel that they are heard, they're listened to, their work gets done, it's not delayed, they're not just a number. Um, and then knowledge transfer is a good picture. Um, it's been important. Um, each of the training workshops have been recorded so that new staff who are onboarding can use this recording to become familiar with the products rather than taking a valuable time from others in the team. But gradually as well, uh, moving away from using contractors in the main and bringing in a lot more perms to reduce the risk of um, the knowledge only being with contractors who can leave after a week's notice. Uh, and obviously with IR35 and other changes, that's been necessary. Uh, right, so um, the last slides are challenges. Um, Whilst we've been able to achieve a number of benefits, there are still challenges that we're facing, keeping in mind that we've only been using service teams for about 10 months. So there's still time remaining for these to mature. Um, so getting the appropriate funding available to resource the teams has been a, a big challenge. Um, this process needs to be easier, as at the moment there's a lot of governance hoops to have to go through. Uh, and we're not always taken serious because we're not developing the new shiny stuff. <laughs> we're just keeping the lights on all the time. That's always taken for granted. Um, reset and service teams is something other than subsets of product support. This is looking at how we can bring more projects into the team rather than just um, keeping the lights on. Since starting up service teams, it's been a case of mostly dealing with support and changes. Trying to ensure that we have the right resources and the right teams working on the right stuff. So with limited resources, we have to continually review the makeup of the team. We're still missing key people, such as uh, a BA and technical architects. Um, project teams receive the priority for that resource other than the service teams. Um, Understanding unfamiliar business processes and systems and people. For example, we built a payment engine recently for one of our products, and there was pockets of business users who weren't identified who should have been included in earlier 
discussions, this resulted in some of the end-to-end -end functionality not working as it should have been. Uh, but that's just been a lack of knowledge of, of who to include in those discussions. Um, but we're a big organisation, you know, we've got uh, 1,500 staff in total uh, and a lot of new staff have joined in recent years. So it's not always clear cut to know who to include in those discussions. Um, ensuring a consistent approach and ways of working across all the service teams. Um, relationship responsibilities with the PMO and a function that we call the digital front door. Um, so bigger changes had been coming through the service team, which took the focus away from the facilitation of the team in terms of decision making, budgets and resourcing. But the front door are gradually starting to handle these instead, and they've got the autonomy to say no to the business, should there not be capacity or budget to pick up the work rather than that be something that the service team should be doing. Uh, making sure that the business understands why we've changed to service teams and been able to demonstrate the benefits and the value. This is becoming less of a challenge because we've been able to build a good reputation. Um, but in the early days, it was difficult because the team was sold on having each of these roles filled. However, we lost a business analyst early doors and they've never been replaced which made the business slightly nervous. Um, so instead, some others in the team ended up more T-shaped, picking up BA responsibility as well as being a product manager. We also need to join up more with the program streaming digital to ensure that we have earlier sight of the big projects, which will eventually land within the service team or to provide an opportunity for the subject matter experts to help with the project. We need to look and think more about the relationship and responsibilities between legacy strategy and service teams. How many of the legacy products can eventually be retired? What can we do now to modernize some of these products? And then finally, um, value. Um, part of the challenge is that people who aren't close to the work day in and day out, such as leaders, don't always understand the value. And we've been exploring other ways to differentiate between the value to the business and what um, brings value to the stakeholder. There needs to be more joining up with organisational objectives. Um, and we do add value um, to the customer relationship, um, but thinking about objectives widely would definitely be a benefit. Uh, and that is it. Have you got any questions? Um, Sorry, I just missed that. Somebody was asking me to put it into present mode, but um, I can share the slides if necessary. Um, Peter's got his hand, his hand fantastic. Peter's got his hand up. Hello. Hi. Um, just a quick question. Um, I think earlier on in the presentation, you've mentioned that you had, um, obviously you're under um, a lot of pressure regarding resource, um, but you had a distinct lack of user researchers. So um, I don't need to tell people on here about the vital role of user researchers in understanding need. Um, so I'm just wondering how you, because they're obviously um, engaging well with stakeholders and they like what you're doing, um, how are you bridging that gap? The lack of um, researchers, are you doing the research yourself or you're, well, or are you kind of? Well, a lot of the changes aren't really significant. So um, the products were were built um, when we had a full multidisciplinary team. So that team would have had a user researcher included. But um, when that project was finished and passed over to us, that user researcher would have been moved off onto other projects. But we have talked about bringing some user researchers in when we do bigger changes. Um, because we do have to consider that element. 
Um, but as I said, um, the project teams have the money available and they have that luxury, which we don't. And it's, we found it a challenge to bring in user researchers, even for some of the projects, never mind to be able to resource a service team. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I guess the thing is, um, sorry, I, just because um, in NHS Digital, I, well, I used to be in the central user, um, user centered design team, user researchers never stops, does it? It's kind of constant when you're making changes and you want to find stuff out. Um, so, yeah, I just kind of thought, well, you know, how do you bridge that gap with having a lack of uh, people in bodies in to do that work? Um, but you're obviously managing. Yeah, we tend to be very T-shaped size, as I mentioned. Uh, we, we we take on some of the roles ourselves um, yeah. just okay. to try and bridge that gap. It's not ideal, um, but we recognise the need to be doing that work. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, have I missed any questions on the chat? Apologies if I have. Um, Any other questions? Feel free to reach out to me um, after this, if you like, if there's anything you think of that you'd like to ask. No? Well, I'll say thank you very much, Chris. Uh, that was excellent. You kept everyone um, fascinated. I think it's so, it's so strange how different the different organisations are. And also some of those, some of those similarities as well. Yeah, yeah. And it's the ability to do things in different ways that perhaps we don't always, um, you know, consider things are possible uh, there. So two things. Thank you for that. I've popped a link in the chat to Mentimeter. It only takes a few seconds. If you could take the trouble to click on the link, give us some feedback. That would be really appreciated. Um, and should we have a little look at what Andy's done? There's your picture, Chris. Wonderful. Is that you? A little bit. <laughs> here's here's Chris here. Well, or a little bit Chris here. And so um got all the good stuff around the service team. We've got I don't know if you can see that down here. We've got the stakeholders down here chatting about how much better the world is with that there. Um we go over here. Well, in terms of progress, uh, the wheels work, which is good. We're able to now corner as well, because uh, and adapt to new ways of working. I uh, thought this uh, half day training sprint was really interesting. And of course, since we're tossing a lot of the red tape, you can actually get on with some of the modernizing. We're building a whole pool of uh, knowledge here through knowledge transfer, more people in house, and there's a little bit around um, around puzzles in there as well. So, yeah, I'll uh, tidy this up and ping it through afterwards. Fantastic! Thank you very much, Andy. Um, so I will. Spent, it seems to spend all my life saying hello and thank you to everyone. Um, uh, yeah, I'll just mention a couple of things coming up then. Um, so, A, if you could do the Mentimeter link, that would be absolutely great. Because um, uh, feedback is always useful about what you want. So it's only as good as its its members, uh, really, and what you, um, what you uh, put in is what you get out. Uh, the next session will be on the 11th of March, same time, same place. I think we might see the fresh invite. That one's looking a bit dodgy. Uh, it's the human side of delivery in a remote world with Andy Taborer, um, which would be great. And then the one after that is uh, introduction to visual facilitation with Andy. You saw there. I'll just mention I put in the email um, yesterday. Also, Andy is running a session, a free session, visual thinking in practice how to apply some of the uh, those sort of visual skills uh, in the workplace. Uh, link is on his website. That is on the 24th of Feb at three o'clock for an hour and a half. And you can watch the last couple of sessions back. James has recorded them, put them on YouTube. Um, and James will be voting, uh, um, uploading this one hopefully to YouTube as well. Um, Andy, James and I we will link up about sending out some comms with those things when they're available. And James has just mentioned about new date for DeliverCon. Unfortunately, DeliverCon was due in April, it's clashing. Um, and now he's looking for a new date, I think in May, James. 
Yeah, <clears throat> it'll either be 11th and 12th of May or 18th and 19th of May. So far, 11th and 12th is winning by about two to one. Cool. Thank you. And is it in person or virtual this year? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I will put the link to the wiki and you can have a look about what people want, their uh, user needs and stuff. I'll put it in the chat now. Fabulous. Well, that's that's del cross gov deliveries annual conference, um, which has been fabulous. I loved I loved the last uh, in person one, which was in Newcastle a couple of years ago. Right, thank you, everyone. Uh, unless anyone's got anything else to add, um, yeah, I think you were there, Andy. Were you you did a big panel at that one. Um, I'll say thank you all very much for coming. That was amazing. We had over eighty people. And uh, thank you to our hero presenters. And I'll see you all next time. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, thank folks. You. That was great. Thank Cheers. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers.